Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me to talk to you today. So my name is Katie Hayward. I'm a professor of political sociology at Queen's University in Belfast. And um, I've been working on the impact of European integration on the island of Ireland for um, over two decades now. And as a consequence of that, I've been working on the question of Brexit and its impact on Northern Ireland. And of course, more recently, the protocol, the Windsor framework and the most recent DUP deal and what they all mean for Northern Ireland and its relationship with the rest of Ireland and the rest of the UK. Um, so I have a presentation to share just to um, keep things on track. The main point I'm just wanting to convey in this talk is a sense of as a means of bringing everybody up to speed with where we are and the kind of journey we've been on, is that Northern Ireland involves a careful balance. And so if we're looking at the stabilization of peace here, what we're wanting to think of all the time is the need to balance between um, various factors that have destabilized Northern Ireland in the past and, um, uh, and in the more recent past, and which need do need to be addressed and um, uh, and considered if Northern Ireland is to have um, peace uh, um, going forward. So it's that balancing act that I'm wanting to stress. Um, I am very delighted that I'm able to speak to you in um, from a sort of a positive position to begin with, given that we do now have a functioning assembly in Stormont, um, and there they all are having reconvened um, just at the beginning of this month. Yes, we're still in February, just at the beginning of this month. Um, and uh, uh, you, the assembly was convened and the executive formed, and at last we have a functioning devolution. Uh, and that, of course, means that other elements of the institutions in Northern Ireland that oversee our governance here, including North South Ministerial Council um, for cross border cooperation on the island of Ireland, and then the British Irish Council where Northern Ireland takes part with other um, devolved um, um, governments uh, um, around the UK, these can now properly function because Northern Ireland's elected representatives can be um, participating. So it's all, it's a very, uh, it's very good place to be. So to highlight this point about balance, um, I almost want to say spot the difference in this picture, and it's not just because the finance minister has his glasses on in one uh, um, picture and not in the other. So this is a picture of our executive um, with uh, Michelle O'Neill on the right there from Sinn Féin and Emma Little Bengeli on the left from the DUP as our first and deputy first ministers. You can see there the picture with Rishi Sunak as prime minister um, meeting the executive. Um, but there's also a picture there with Leo Varadkar, so the Taoiseach uh, Prime Minister of Ireland um, also got a chance to have his photograph taken. Um, it is very unusual that the Taoiseach and the Prime Minister didn't have their photo taken together. Um, and that really reflects some of the tensions that's been there in British-Irish relations um, for the last um, while post-Brexit. Um, and things have improved somewhat, but they're, they're not um, certainly not back to the way they had been before. Um, and so that's the first point of balance I want to stress is that British-Irish relationship needs to be balanced and cooperative in order for Northern Ireland to function. So the fact that they um, one warmed the seat for the other in this photo shoot, it, it, opportunity is a good sign, but again, it's not, it's not quite back to the way we'd like to see it. One thing to note with this um, picture of the executive is that of course we have um, four parties represented here. So Sinn Féin, the DUP, We've got the Ulster Unionist Party with one minister, Robin Swan, and we also have the Alliance Party with two ministers um, for um, agriculture, environment and justice. Um, so this is the nature of the government in Northern Ireland. We have to have a coalition. Um, and therefore, around that table, not only do you have different ministries represented, but different parties from very, very different perspectives. So again, another form of balance that has to be managed with Northern Ireland. I mentioned our first and deputy first ministers, um, and they have two junior ministers as well, um, Ashling Riley and um, Pam Campbell. And they are um, uh, interesting because, of course, it's four, four women there 
in the Northern Ireland um, Executive Office. Um, Emma Little-Bengeli and Michelle O'Neill are quite well experienced politicians at this stage. Um, it's also worth noting in something re really um, emphasizes the unique nature of Northern Ireland is that um, Emma Little-Bengeli has been elected before. She's been an MP and M MLA. She wasn't actually elected in the assembly election. She is sitting there because um, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Jeffrey Donaldson, did run for the assembly in the May 22 elections, but he didn't take his seat. He decided to stay in Westminster. And so what you can do in Northern Ireland is you can give your seat to somebody else. And he gave his seat to Emma Little-Bengeli. Um, um, and so she is now in the position, she was nominated by the party to be Deputy First Minister. That role is equal to that of First Minister, uh, just the title is different. The whole reason we haven't had an executive functioning for the last um, over two years um, has been because um, of the decision of the DP not to participate in the executive, not to nominate a Deputy First Minister. And so uh, you can't have a first minister without a deputy first minister. So hence the, the, the system had been um, suspended for, for two years, uh, just about. This is another sign of the Balancing Act in Northern Ireland. So we've got here Chris Heaton-Harris as the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Geoffrey Donaldson as the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. And this, again, tells you something about how unusual things are here. So they are making this announcement about the safeguarding the union deal that meant that the DUP decided to go back into power sharing to nominate ministers to the executive, to nominate a speaker, to allow the assembly to sit. And they decided to make that announcement in um, Hillsborough Castle, which is associated with, well, it's the actual, the residence of the Secretary of State in Northern Ireland. It's very nice. Um, but it's associated with the Anglo-Irish Agreement and indeed with other significant British-Irish multi-party agreements in, in Northern Ireland uh, to date. The fact that this announcement was made with just one party leader tells you something new has happened. So that relationship and negotiation between the British government and a single party is very, uh, it's unknown. And it tells you about how uh, the sort of strange journey we've, we've come on that you had a negotiation between a single party and one government. Um, that was absolutely critical for getting power sharing up and running again. And in that handshake, uh, well, there's a lot behind that handshake. There's been a lot of tension in the relationship between the DUP and the Conservative Party. Um, some of it has been productive tension, uh, but a lot of it has been about the DUP thinking that they had been betrayed by Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party over the Brexit arrangements. Um, and so the rebuilding of trust in that relationship um, has taken some time. Um, and so hence, um, to have them there making this announcement together is unusual in several respects. I don't expect you to know these two individuals, um, but again, something of a balancing act is represented here. So these two individuals um, are the most vocal opponents of the DUP's return to the Assembly. Uh, they have been the most vocal critics of the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, the Brexit arrangements for Northern Ireland. Um, uh, on the left there, you have Jamie Bryson, who um, works closely with uh, loyalist communities, um, has been a very um, articulate um, a, um, a communicator of loyalist perspectives on the Protocol. He's a regular commentator in the media, um, and a very um, stern critic um, of the legal implications of the protocol. Um, he's been associated in the past with protests over the protocol and other forms of loyalist protest. So um, the fact that he's in there in the assembly, it's kind of unusual to be making a statement to the press, uh, criticizing their return um, to Stormont. Um, standing beside him is Jim Allister, who is the leader of the traditional unionist voice. He's the only elected MLA of that party, but he is probably disproportionately influential because the DUP have been very concerned that they have been losing votes to the TUV, the more hardline unionist, hardline anti-protocol pro-Brexit party in Northern Ireland. So even though they only have one MLA, 
um, a bit like the way that the Conservative Party have listened to um, UKIP and possibly now reform UK in the past and being minded to, to kind of mirror their policies in some ways. Similarly, the TUV has been very influential of the DUP and the way that they've um, approached Brexit and the protocol. Um, now, what's striking is they are both there in the Assembly when the Assembly reconvened. Um, what we had expected, um, fairly confidently predicted actually, would, was that there would be loyalist protests um, when Stormont was reconvened, because we know that there's been a lot of opposition to it and a lot of opposition to the DUP's acceptance of the protocol. Uh, both Jamie Bryson and Jim Allister are very strong critics of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. They think it was a mistake for the DUP ever to sign up to its successor agreements, uh, and they don't want to see the Assembly sitting on those on those terms. Um, and they represent that, as I say, a strong protest community and loyalism. However, on the day, there were no protests on the street. It was, it was very calm. All the attention was on what was happening in the assembly. So that marked a new, a new phase for for Northern Ireland. Um, I can talk more about that in questions if you have some on that. So one thing that the DUP and the British government in particular had to bear in mind when they were negotiating to try and persuade the DUP to come back into power sharing and end their protest about the protocol was that the fact that the British government had to comply with two international agreements. So one is the British-Irish agreement that underpins the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. Um, it is constrained in that way with respect to what it can do for Northern Ireland uh, in constitutional terms. Um, so the 1998 Act, Northern Ireland Act, that reflects the Good Friday Agreement, um, is very strict about um, um, changes that can be made to Northern Ireland's constitutional status, for example, um, very much being giving consideration to the need for parity of esteem between nationalism and unionism, and um, uh, that and the importance of that British-Irish relationship in the Irish dimension. So that was one international agreement the British government had to comply with. The other there um, is the withdrawal agreement, uh, that the UK and the EU came to at the end of 2019 and signed, ratified in 2020. Um, and that withdrawal agreement, of course, um, as we know, took longer to negotiate than had been originally anticipated, hence the um, extension of the um, exit day for the UK. Um, and the reason why it took longer was because of the issue of Northern Ireland to how to manage all of that. And that withdrawal agreement therefore contains the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland in the back. And you can see that in the first in objectives of the protocol, uh, Article 1 of the protocol, it talks about um, the purpose of the protocol being to address the unique circumstances on the island, to mean necessary conditions for continued north-south cooperation on the island, to avoid a hard border on the island, and to protect the 98 agreement in all its dimensions. So those, so the withdrawal um, agreement between the UK and the EU references another international agreement that the UK government has to comply with and bear in mind, and that's the 98 Good Friday Agreement. Um, this again is another reason uh, why Northern Ireland is so unique. So in coming to that protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland and, and managing the process of Brexit, what had to be borne in mind? Well, again, we have a balancing act here. We have the fact that Northern Ireland did vote to remain overall 56%, um, but there was a very strong pro-leave vote and um, uh, um, sentiment as well. Um, it was a complicated dynamic. Um, I'm just Got this image here to remind ourselves of the um, uh, full front page ad that um, the Democratic Unionist Party took out in Metro uh, newspaper in, in London, uh, which cost something like 285,000. And a very good book has been written by Peter Gagan um, on basically on democracy for sale. And he looks at the funding that came from that and um, from that ad. Uh, that was from pro-leave sources. Um, in Northern Ireland, parties don't have to identify the sources of their funding up to a certain point, um, and for security reasons, given our history. 
And so this was used as sort of a backdoor means by which the DUP, sorry, a pro um, leave advert could be taken out in advance of the referendum you, through the DUP. So what you can see from that is that the DUP's connections to pro leave movements in the UK, across the UK, and indeed influenced internationally, were very strong and close. And that relationship continued on through the Brexit process. Of course, the DUP became really important in for the Theresa May's government with the confidence and supply arrangement of 2017. And, um, and of course, then that um, uh, they became, uh, yes, disproportionately influential when it, when it was um, about how Westminster would approach um, uh, the situation in Northern Ireland through the Brexit negotiations. Um, also, on the other hand, there you have the anti-Brexit, the pro-Remain sentiment, which even in the referendum was making reference to the fact that um, people did not want a return to um, border checks and controls um, on the Irish border, and I've spoken to you about this before, um, but this sense that Brexit does mean borders and therefore um, in order to avoid a hard border and avoid a return to the borders of the past, um, they wanted people to vote to remain, so Northern Ireland stayed with Ireland in the EU. Um, a very different sentiment of borders is reflected in the DUP's um, advert with taking back control of borders, of course, being a mantra that they shared with other pro-leave um, movements. Uh, this is a bit of a blast from the past, but also to remind ourselves of the challenge that the British government had to navigate in thinking about Northern Ireland. So on the one hand, they were thinking about the no deal, those supporters of a no deal, the strong pro-leave people um, and movements in, um, uh, in the UK, particularly focusing on what was happening in Westminster, very influential, of course, in the Conservative Party. So that push to simply leave and um, hang the consequences um, had to be managed by the British government internally. Um, but when it came to dealing with Northern Ireland, um, they obviously were not able to do so simply unilaterally because, because of the fact that the Irish border is, of course, an external border of the Republic of Ireland and therefore of the EU. And so the fact that the Republic of Ireland continued very much to be a, a confident and um, a keen member state um, was uh, again shaping um, particular dynamics in the negotiation process. Um, so when you saw the British government there negotiating, as I say, they're trying to manage um, they're sitting across the, from the table from Ireland, most directly impacted by what would happen in Northern Ireland and what the UK would decide to do, uh, but of course conscious of pressures at home to uh, simply leave even with a no deal, regardless of the consequences. Um, a couple of other things that when we think about Northern Ireland, um, we need to bear in mind is the continued existence of paramilitary organisations. Um, and uh, those there was um, warnings from the police and other um, security experts that dissident Republicans um, were continuing to be active and wanted to exploit the Brexit uncertainty. Um, there was a car bomb exploded, for example, um, and some um, um, a rise in activity amongst dissident Republicans during the Brexit negotiation process. Um, there was also the murder of Lyra McKee, um, a journalist, in April 2019. She wasn't the intended target, the police were, but um, very much it showed that dissident Republicans are active and dangerous. And this is a picture of a protest that was made in the offices of um, a party in, in Derry City that's very much associated with dissident um, Republican activity. Um, so people were conscious that this, this, um, these paramilitary um, groups were active and wanting to exploit uncertainty. Um, and the uncertainty was there, not just around what the nature of Brexit would be that the UK would decide upon, but also about what the UK had agreed with the EU. So even after the withdrawal agreement was negotiated um, and after the protocol had been concluded as part of that, at the same time as 
businesses in Northern Ireland were being told to prepare for the new arrangements, albeit they didn't get enough guidance on what the protocol meant for them, um, or indeed for GB businesses entering Northern Ireland. Um, they 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 were trying to they were being guided to some degree by local government departments in Northern Ireland on that. Um, at the same time as that, the British government was downplaying the significance of the protocol. So you could see there on the 1st of January when the protocol came into effect. At the same time, above the BBC story about the Irish Sea Trade border operating now, Brandon Lewis, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, is tweeting that there is no Irish Sea border. Um, so of course there's deep confusion about what it would mean. Um, and you can see that, pro that graffiti about the no Irish Sea border um, that was there at the beginning of January and it's continued on since that language about no Irish sea border. So we moved quickly from the British government's insistence that there was no sea border, when experts such as myself and others were saying, well, yes, there is a border, you do have to manage that now with the protocol. We moved quickly from that to the British government reflecting the language of protesters in Northern Ireland saying there should be no Irish sea border. And that's continued on in 2021. Um, we had a rise in loyalist opposition to the protocol in early 2021, um, including um, times when um, loyalist paramilitaries, and they continue to exist too, said that they were no longer recognising the conditions of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement um, and reviewing their ceasefires. So a rising sense of uncertainty um, and a refusal to um, recognise the agreement, um, and if you like, the international agreement, the international law of the of 1998 amongst loyalist paramilitaries, um, um, supported, as I mentioned, by some who don't recognise the agreement at all. And then on the other hand, you had the British government, um, as particularly the Prime Minister, suggesting that, or uh, indicating that, not, that the UK would breach international law um, by... Um, taking unilateral action with respect to the protocol if the EU didn't change it. And so in 2022, uh, we had the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill put forward by Liz Truss, then Foreign Secretary, um, which was basically going to see the UK unilaterally change the way that the protocol worked. Um, so I think there's interesting parallels there and threats to break international law, not recognise it. Um, so we had two, uh, three <laughs> years of uncertainty, actually, um, over what was going to happen with the protocol um, continue to be in place, etc. Uh, we saw the DUP come out early on in July 2021, saying that, that um, the, there had to be serious changes to the protocol that had undermined Northern Ireland's position in the UK and in the UK internal market. Now they had originally been um, uh, said that they would accept it, but given in light of the protests and various other things that happened, including the fact that the, the there were empty shelves in early January 21, they quickly became very strongly opposed to it. So you can see the tests there that they were talking about. Um, and that language about no border in the Irish Sea was reflected in protests on the streets, as I mentioned. Um, and they were particularly active in um, in 21, uh, um, uh, quite visible around that time. And what's interesting then is that you saw political leaders from the TV, from the DUP, and on occasion from the Ulster Unionist Party associating themselves with these protests from loyalists. Just note the banner there, just note the image of that banner. It's a very familiar banner, um, that's from Lurgan, but we have them from South Belfast, um, all around Northern Ireland, these banners. So look at the image of the UK there. And then that is reflected in um, this image here, which is of the UK government's responses to these protests um, and to this challenge of what to do for Northern Ireland. So in this, um, we see the, no, the Republic of Ireland is basically erased um, for all intents and purposes. 
um, the Isle of Man has disappeared um, by safe by the time we came to safeguarding the Union. But these are the two main means by which the protocol has been amended. I just want to explain what that means. So the Windsor framework was negotiated, thankfully, um, uh, confidently by the UK and the EU um, in 2023, um, just over a year ago now. And they um, they negotiated that um, very carefully um, to tweak and adjust the um, protocol in practice. Um, and as you can see there, the joint statement from the two, Ursula von der Leyen and Rishi Sunak, was stressing that they were these changes were made to respond to the needs of businesses in Northern Ireland. Um, and so the the political change that was in the framework was the commitment of the UK and the EU to find mutually agreeable solutions, i.e. to avoid confrontation with each other, um, that the Northern Ireland Assembly would have some role um, with respect to the application of EU law in Northern Ireland, the so-called Stormont Break, commitments of stakeholder engagement from the UK and the EU. And then in practical terms, the development of a so-called green lane meant that people, businesses in GB um, who register in advance can sell goods directly to consumers in Northern Ireland, including those that couldn't be sold elsewhere in the EU. Um, and a lot of that involves the labelling of products as not for sale in the EU, not for EU um, labelling. Um, however, despite intention, or certainly the, the hopes of the British government, that was not enough to see the DUP go back in and agree to allow power sharing to function again. Their protests continued. Um, and so we then had that very unusual phase of direct talks between one party and one government. And the reason this is unusual is because basically what they're trying to do is through those one party, one government talks to restore two international agreements effectively. So to restore the full functioning of the Good Friday Agreement and the full functioning of the withdrawal agreement by enabling the protocol to be implemented. Uh, anyway, we did come to that deal, the so-called safeguarding the union deal um, with the command paper there from the British government um, and Jeffrey Donaldson did a good job in selling it. Um, he's brought most of his uh, vast majority of his MLAs with him. Um, half of his MPs, the eight MPs in Westminster, um, a minority of the peers in the House of Lords. But essentially, there is the momentum there. And from polling that we've done recently, um, we can see that uh, the plurality of DUP supporters um, fully endorse them going back in now and want to see the institutions functioning. So what was in that deal that made the difference? So you can see how he's spun it there, um, um, making very big claims. Um, the biggest change really um, is the development of new bodies, UK East West Council, which is just all across the UK, uh, different to the British Irish Council, of course, it doesn't include Ireland something called the Intertrade UK to support trade in the UK internal market. There's something about ministers, if they're bringing bills in the UK, um, they have to state whether it would have significant adverse impact on trade between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. If it doesn't, or sorry, if it will, they don't have to not bring forward that legislation. They just have to acknowledge that it will impact it. Um, and um, that moves on to a different body to see how to deal with that. It also promised and it's, and it's brought forward legislation to ensure that there won't be any new deal with the EU that would introduce a regulatory border between Northern Ireland and Britain. That was specifically something that the DUP had had in one of its demands. Also, as part of this, all across the UK, you're going to see not the EU labelling rolled out uh, it'll be on shelves uh, and must particularly be on products, um, meat and dairy in the first instance, agri-food products. So I, I've i gone over, I've gone spoken for longer than I wanted to, um, but I will just very quickly say, will this work? Um, and I think there are four things to ask ourselves when we look at any agreement. Um, basically, first of all, credibility, are people, are the protagonists trusted? And this is a survey data that we've done in Queens since spring and levels of trust. And I just draw your attention to the bottom dashed line there, which is trust in the UK government. And you can see that 
Um, only 4% of people in Northern Ireland trust the UK government when it comes to um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, the protocol in Northern Ireland. The, the, uh, the dashed red line there is DUP. You can see they've slightly dropped in their levels of trust post-deal. That's not too surprising. We do see a rise in that unbroken red line of trust, and that's in trust in the Northern Ireland executive, but that's really because it didn't exist <laughs> before, and now it does exist, so people are more likely to trust it. Trust in the EU, trust in the Irish government has remained pretty much unchanged over the course of the past three years or so, and tr business leaders, business representatives are most trusted. What else is an issue, uh, something that they could look for is clarity, agreement on what the problem is that's being solved and what the solution is. Um, and we see this time now that people are pretty much unchanging in their sense that of reliable information being available. So only just over half people think reliable information is available. Um, and um, we saw a slight decline in those who think that they have a good understanding of the protocol post DEP deal. So essentially people are recognizing it's becoming more complicated. I mentioned there's a lot of spin about the DEP deal and what it means, and that is problematic. Will the third element is cooperation. Is the agreement sold and delivered jointly? Are all players committed to seeing it work? Um, this is just a, a sort of a sign that you have a difference between unionists, particularly strong unionists and others in Northern Ireland with respect to the Stormont break. Um, and that, those, that's the purple line there. And I think that's going to be potentially problematic because we see the DP have come into the assembly wanting to put brakes on literally on the, on the implementation of the protocol and slow that down. So they have come in not because they're fully supportive of it, um, but because actually they want to reduce its impact on Northern Ireland. And as I say, that's against the wishes of supporters of other parties. And then last but not least, certainty. What can be expected as a consequence? Is it likely to be bedded in and become uncontroversial, which is what people would imagine is key to stability? Um, and this is my last slide now, showing um, agreement or um, views on whether political debate in Northern Ireland should move on from Brexit and the Windsor framework. Um, and you can see from this that strong unionists, um, the plurality of them don't think that political debate should move on from Brexit and the Windsor framework. They want to continue um, um, emphasizing that because they think that the Windsor framework, the protocol does undermine Northern Ireland's place in the constitution or in, in the UK constitution. And they want to keep an eye on it. Whereas people from all other backgrounds, including slight unionists, the clear majority of them just want to stop talking about Brexit and the Windsor framework and to move on. So will will it become bedded in? Will it become uncontroversial? I, it's unlikely, um, given the wish is still of strong unionists to, to make sure it is maintained as an issue of um, contention. And I've given you a lot of information. Um, I would just encourage you to, if you're interested, and thank you for your interest, to have a look at our post-Brexit governance NI project website, um, which contains um, some simple blogs, um, some explainers of varying lengths, including of the Safeguarding the Union deal and the storm break, um, and then more details on our opinion polling.